Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. is our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Well, thank you, and we are going to talk about Jesus. You know, last week we had a lot of fun, didn't we? Those of you that were listening, and I hope you were, and we decided that I would be interviewed by you. Well, people liked it, but they, what they said is they had questions and they didn't get a chance to ask. So we're going to do the same thing one more time. I'll give you a chance to interview me. In the meantime, you can start calling now if you want to. We have our 35th anniversary. This week, uh, on Saturday, we will have a Feast of Our Lady, the Visitation, and then Sunday, especially in America, we have the Corpus Christi. Two awesome truths. Our Lady, and the Eucharist. And you know, when, when um, Don Bosco had that vision I've talked to you about before, he saw the, this terrible storm and the Holy Father was guiding the ship and suddenly out of the ocean came two big pillars, one with Our Lady on it and the other with the Eucharist. And that's what calmed everything down and, and brought the church into peace and quiet. And in the, the big basilica of Don Bosco, our, our Lady of Hopper Christians, there is the date in 18 something that the basilica was built. And then at the other it says 19. So whatever Don Bosco saw, he felt it was in this century. So we got three and a half years left to wake up and give, give our Lord and the Eucharist and Our Lady the opportunity to, to save the world. I think we all know that no political party, no group, and no single nation or group of nations or united of nations can ever bring anything back. We got so far now, we have to ask Our Lady to come and save us for her son Jesus. And we have to have that love for the Eucharist I thought tonight, while I'm waiting for you to interview me, we would look at a little man. I hope I can find it. I got it in this book someplace. A man called Zacchaeus. Very short and not well loved. Why? Well, he was head of all the publicans, and the publicans were like, internal revenue. Unlike the internal revenue though, they took maybe 10% for Rome and 15 for themselves. A nice little thing going. So Zacchaeus was head of all these, see? And Zacchaeus was a Jew. And he had no business being in that kind of thing. He was hated by everyone. Oh, you poor sinners out there. You are still loved by God. It's unfortunate that you don't love him. 
but he loves you. And he will always go after you, you know. He makes the first move. And this is one of these small, small events in the gospel that prove many things. First, that to God, Jesus is God. All things are presence, and he knew exactly what Zacchaeus did. So this was in Jericho, and he's gone through the town when a man whose uh, name was Zacchaeus made his appearance, and he was one of the senior tax collectors and a wealthy man. Wow. Mm. He was anxious to see what kind of man Jesus was. He's too short. Maybe that's why he stole a lot, you know. He stole from all the tall people. <laughs> and he, was too, he could not see it for the crowd. You could see this little man running around, and he's behind this one, and he's three feet taller, and he goes behind that one. He goes behind a teenager, and he can't see either. So he's getting a little upset, so he ran ahead. And you could just see him running and he climbed a sycamore tree. By the way, I hope I don't get 2,000 sycamore trees, but you see these beads? I, these, these are petrified woods. Amazing, isn't it? Something could get so petrified. <laughs> but anyway, they say that in a sycamore tree, has beads this this little darker. They last a hundred years. If anybody has in his yard a sycamore tree, don't cut it down and send it to me. But I need to know, are there beads this size on a sycamore tree? Or is it the wood? Some of you are carpenters. Anybody here got a sycamore tree? Well, shows you how scarce it is, huh? Maybe you got one. Where? I have lots of. I have lots of them. I'm in the nursery business. <laughs> Thank you. I'll see you after the show. Isn't God good? Of all the nights I could have asked for a sycamore tree, there it is tonight. Isn't God wonderful, huh? They may be famous last words, but anyway. So this man runs up a sycamore tree to catch a glimpse of Jesus. Now, what would you do to see Jesus? That's a good question, is it, huh? Would you run up a sycamore tree? Would you run ahead of a crowd to see Jesus? See, you don't have to do any of those because you got the Eucharist. Some of you won't even fight mass. I mean, fight the, 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 the traffic to go to mass on Sunday morning. You won't walk a mile. This man ran. He wanted to see Jesus. So he ran ahead. All he wanted was to see Jesus, that's all. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up. And he said, Zacchaeus, he knew his name. He knows your name, you're not fooling him. If you saw Jesus and he said, who are you? You couldn't change your name. He knows your name. He said, Zacchaeus, come down, hurry. Because I must stay at your house today. Ah, oh, now who could I think of? Your nearest internal revenue man. <laughs> who else? Your banker that you owe a big mortgage to and can't pay. How about him? Hmm. And what would happen? If Jesus came along and invited him and said, I have to stay at your house tonight, wouldn't you think in five seconds all the terrible things that banker or lawyer or doctor or somebody else did to you? Wouldn't you have words to say? 
Wouldn't you? Yeah, you would. I couldn't tell you the words I'd have to say. And he hurried down and welcomed him joyfully. Can you imagine this little guy so excited? And they complained when they saw what was happening. Now, isn't it strange that we want to save souls, but we don't want sinners to be saved? Especially right before they die. I mean, we want them to suffer a little bit. <laughs> we want them to trip on a banana peel, anything. We want, them, we want to feel they almost didn't make it. And this is a man who was really a thief. And they said, mm, he's gone to stay at a sinner's house. And Zacchaeus stood his ground. He said, look, sir, I'm going to give half of my property to the poor. Don't you think those people straightened up? I bet they inched towards this little guy and said, uh, let's get in front here. All of a sudden, this little man looked very nice. He's going to give half of his bundle to the poor. And then he said, and if I've cheated anybody, I will pay him back four times the amount. I'll make a bet that after he did all that, he still had a bundle. Well, doesn't this show, for the rest of us who are poor sitters, doesn't it show the mercy of God? I like to ask a question. How is it that you and I maybe go to Mass regularly, every week, every day, we see Jesus, we receive the body and blood, soul, divinity of Jesus in our soul? Why is it? Zacchaeus just saw his physical body there. He knew he was a great man. Don't you wonder the difference between Zacchaeus and the rest of us? I mean, when we see Jesus in the Eucharist, when we receive Jesus in the Eucharist, how is it that we don't suddenly think of doing something wonderful for somebody, like changing our life? Stopping some grievous sin we're in. Giving half to the poor. <laughs> I could take a quarter of that. But really, we don't. We seem to go to Mass every Sunday or every day, and we walk out the same person we walked in. Did you ever notice that? How is it? that Zacchaeus was not baptized as you and I, did not have the divine indwelling as you and I, didn't have all these awesome truths. He just was curious, and he ran ahead to see Jesus. And our Lord was so happy over that. Even though his physical vision was obscured by the crowd, Jesus saw that soul run and climb a tree to see Jesus. Now, what is going to happen when you run or you just stop your car a few minutes and go into your church and see Jesus? Hope you can find him. What would happen to you? Do you think God would give you the same grace? I'm sure. Absolutely sure. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. This man too is the son of Abraham. For the account of man has come out to seek out and save what was lost. And that's what this network's all about. We're here to seek what is lost. 
Some of you are listening tonight a lot. You say, well, you know that, you can't judge. Oh, don't give me that stuff. You know that? You can't judge, for goodness sakes. What do you mean you can't judge? If you're living up with some girl and sacking up with her, you got to judge. You judge yourself. That's not judging. It's wrong. It's sinful. Mortally sinful. Hmm. A lot of people don't want to tell you that, but it's mortally, what does it mean? If you died with that on your soul, you were not repentant. So Jesus wouldn't do that. It isn't Jesus, it's you. See, if you get in the habit of saying no to Jesus, what makes you think when you die you're gonna say yes, huh? You're gonna keep saying no. So Jesus knew that these people were jealous. You know, there's a strange thing, a phenomenon that I'm always surprised at, and that is the divine indwelling. The divine indwelling. Did you know that when you're baptized, you receive, I don't care if you're two days old or 20 years old, you receive into your heart the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You become a tabernacle of the Holy Spirit, <coughs> of Jesus. You become a living monstrance. Isn't that awesome? Ooh, wow. If you could remember that, if you could remember that, ah, you want one of my cough drop? <laughs> They're very good. Somebody gave you one? Oh, Brother Leo. I tell you what, I'm not changing the subject, but I was at a conference last year, I think, and I'm up there about ready to cough. I couldn't hold it. And I said to somebody, somebody, have a cough drop. I bet 25 people got up like that. <laughs> and before I knew it, I had a bag, a whole bag of cough drop. That's generosity. But see, I always wonder, and I wonder about myself too, you know, I receive Jesus every morning. We have to change, see? The key is change just by looking down at it from a tree and seeing this awesome God man. Oh, wow. How is it we can pass our church and don't go in? You say it's locked. Why? We're afraid somebody will go in and steal. The way you build your churches, who wants it? <laughs> who wants these gymnasiums you're building and call spaces? Who wants a space? You could keep it open day and night. Nobody's going to go in there. There's nothing to steal. <sighs> we have Jesus. Saturday we celebrate the Feast of Visitation. When Elizabeth saw her cousin Mary. And what did Elizabeth say when she saw Mary coming? She said, Oh, who am I that the mother, my Lord, should visit me? Oh, wow. And our lady talked about the awesome, magnificat, my soul shall magnify the Lord. See, Elizabeth saw Mary and her heart exalted. Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus saw Jesus and he was converted. 
We're going to have a wonderful procession on Sunday. Our priests and brothers are all being decked out and carry candles. And we're going to carry Jesus to three separate altars. The people will sing, you're welcome. They're all coming to see Jesus. Process. We don't have processions anymore. We've got to have one. To see the Blessed Sacrament carried, carried by a holy priest with incense and flowered little, little girls throwing uh, roses, petals onto the ground. Wow. Uh, they're all coming to see Jesus on his great feast of the body of Christ. What will happen to you when you see Jesus? When you come into our chapel and there he is, and you'll know he's there, like the Zacchaeus knew. And even if you're a great sinner, you'll know because he was a great sinner his curiosity converted him. He said, oh, wow, this man is special. And I will give half of what I have to the poor. And I've cheated anybody. You know, he cheated him. I give you back four times. While all these people were trying to figure out how much he owed them and how much each would get from that half of his fortune, Jesus had one thing in mind. I don't want to have supper with you tonight. See, we want to look at what happened to Jesus when he looked at Zacchaeus. We all know what happened to Zacchaeus when he saw Jesus. What happened to Jesus when he saw Zacchaeus' heart? Not his Stealing little hands. When he saw his heart, he invited himself to supper. Wow. Why are you so afraid to go to confession? Why is it some of you still don't like Our Lady? I bet before you got married, if you said to your husband, I hate your mother, If he was a decent man, <laughs> if he was a decent man, he would have said bye-bye. But yet a lot of you hate the mother of Jesus. See what happened? Something happened when, when Elizabeth saw Mary. She was a lot older too. And what happened to Elizabeth when Mary saw her? <gasps> Elizabeth was sanctified because she cried out in joy. And John leaped in her womb. He said, well, what's that? It happens to every pregnant woman. No, no. That was a sign of John the Baptist was sanctified by the presence of Mary carrying Jesus. Jesus began salvation, redemption. He was, his sin of original sin in John the Baptist was wiped away. Wow. When he saw Jesus, he reacted. We don't react when we see Jesus. So we don't want to get too emotional, you know. I mean, we have to be sedate. I don't know about that. Here I go again with these. Uh, you know, I never understand about ice. I fight with it every day. <sighs> See, you go to pay to sip the white water, the ice hits your nose. <laughs> no matter how you turn it, it follows you like a piranha in a boat. Send my, somebody sent me one of these patient rings. I call them patient because it saved me from a lot of 
wet noses. They, a little thing, they all got lost. So if you have any more nose protectors <laughs> <laughs> that you could find, she sent me once. I don't have to fight with ice. Where was I? On Zacchaeus. Well, anyway, it's time for a question. Hello. Hello, Mother. Where are you from? I'm calling from Kalamazoo, Michigan. Wonderful. What is your question? I'm wondering how the television network started. Uh, we're new to this. We haven't seen it, uh, well, for about a year now. Hmm. We're wondering how the television got, uh, network got started and what uh, really brought it into being. If you mm -hmm. have some background on that, I'd appreciate it. Well, that's a long story, but I'll try to tell it to you real quick. In 1973, the Lord began to give me books to write, and as a result of those books, our sisters printed them, and we gave them away, and people began to ask me to give talks. And uh, so I did, and I got invited to a channel in Chicago, Illinois, uh, that was a Protestant uh, television network, and I was invited to a talk show. And uh, <clears throat> in the studio, as I walked in the studio, like this one, only much, 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 much smaller, uh, I realized how small it was. And I said, wow, to myself. I said, it doesn't take much to reach the masses, you know? was small. I said, Lord, I've got to have one of these. <laughs> I didn't think it was asking too much. <laughs> and, and But I thought, what would you do with it, you know? So I came home, and I got to cut this short, you know, but I came home and made a tape. It was a disaster. Oh, it was terrible. I mean, really bad, bad. I look like Grandma Moses sitting at a rocking chair. <laughs> and most of you are too young to know Andy Gump, but that's how I look. <laughs> and I was ready to junk it, you know, and the sister said, no, Mother, you can do it. I said, okay, one more time I'll try. Well, I did, but then I didn't know what to do with it. I had a tape about this big in my hand. I didn't know what to do with it. So I asked a friend of mine, and she said, well, why don't you send it to CBN? So they called me. I was surprised she brought it there. They called me in two weeks and said, Mother, um, we saw your tape and we think it's very good. I said, you do? I said, yes. Can you make 60 of them? I said, oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know what it means to make 60 half-hour shows? I didn't. But I thought, well, why not try? So we, we found a place, and I made 60 shows, sent them to them. was on another series when I saw a synopsis of a movie called The Word, blasphemous movie, depict Jesus as a false prophet. So I noticed that, that uh, network I was, at, was gonna air it. So I asked to see the manager, and, I said, are you going to air this movie? He said, yes. I said, are you Christian? He said, yes. I said, you, you air a blasphemous movie. Oh, he said, do you think God cares? Well, that time I was ready to. I said, yes, he cares, and I care. Are you going to air it or not? Anyway, he said he was, and I walked out of the studio. I told him I would not air my programs. I would no longer make programs or air them on his station. He said to me, you leave this station, you're off of television. I said, oh no, I don't need you. I only need God. I'll build my own. And that's what you call having a big mouth. <laughs> But I just didn't have the slightest idea what to do. And that's, we made it, we built it, we did build the studio. I came home, I told her sisters, and that, that morning we decided to build a garage. And when I told them I wouldn't know what to do, 
I said, where can I build a studio? And he said, garage. I said, ah, garage. So I went down and I said to them, the contractor was already digging a foundation. And I said, hold it. He said, what's the matter? I said, we're not going to build a garage. He said, what are you going to build? I said, a television studio. <laughs> said, oh, what? <laughs> I said, television studio. We did. We did. The wonderful story. I have a book on it. You ought to get one. It shows all the wonders, wonders of God's providence. Providence. Unbelievable providence. He wanted this network for you in these serious times. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother Angelica. Yeah. My name is Carmen, and I'm from Bayonne, New Jersey. Wonderful. And I have to tell you right off the bat that my wife, Frances, and myself absolutely love you and adore you. You're a big inspiration to us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, Mother Angelica, I, I work in a big firm at Wall Street. And uh, I, I live in the corporate world, so to speak. And I don't always go by uh, how corporate people act to certain things. And uh, I was just wondering, when you have a tough day and, and you don't want to be jealous and you don't want to be mad or anything like that, is there a certain type of prayer you could pray to God and or St. Joseph to help you get through a tough time? Well, you've already been victorious by the fact that you said you don't want to. That's very key. Uh, you don't want to feel, you said, jealous. You don't want to feel anger. That's number one, very important. That tells me and tells Jesus that isn't in your heart, it's up here. <clears throat> when you're aware now, you may not be aware for a few minutes or a few hours that you have a, a bad disposition over somebody or you're jealous, then say, Jesus, I'm sorry, but that's me, and help me not to be jealous again. And pray for that person you're jealous of. Just short prayer. I don't know how, as a broker in New York, you have any time. Did you ever see this uh, exchange? Don't they look like a bunch of nuts, you know? <laughs> I, I never saw such a distraught group of people. The funny part is to me that somebody somewhere knows when they're going this way and this way and that way and this way. It's amazing the country survives. I wouldn't be jealous of anybody. We're all created by God for a special reason, to have a special degree of glory in His kingdom, he promised us that he would go and prepare a place for us, just for you. And nobody is like you. There's been nobody in the world from Adam and Eve to now like you. Is that awesome? And there'll be nobody like you after you. You're unique. All of you in snow country. There's not two you met a big blizzard. There's not two flakes of snow that look alike. And what do you do? Uh snow. And God says, Oh, I'm gonna make every flake different. You hate to walk on them, you know? They're all different. So don't, it's okay. We can't help what we feel. And I'm glad to say you don't want it. That's a big step. So just be simple. Be gentle with yourself. You can say St. Michael prayer, but oh, I don't think you have time in that kind of business to say St. Michael prayer. <laughs> Sometimes you can be, I got a little book. Well, I didn't have it. The Lord gave me, it's called Ad Lib with the Lord. It's for people just like you. What is it, $5?
I got the vice president here to tell me what it cost. Five dollars. You're a broker. <laughs> Did I hear him right? So, get that little book, I'll send it to you, and just look at it and you'll come up with a brand new way of talking to God. We have another call. Hello? Hello? Where are you from? Triangle, Virginia. And what is your question? Well, Mother, I just want to say I love you and Thanks. I love all the sisters Thank you, Jesus. and all the brothers. And I was wondering, how did the brothers start? Like, how did you think of their order? I really didn't. I really don't think much. <laughs> now, what am I saying here? <laughs> oh, dear. What I meant was, I never thought of beginning a network. We never thought of beginning a brother, brotherhood. But the Lord asked me to do that in 1977. 78. And um, it took time because I I always wait for the Lord. If, if I feel the Lord is telling me to do something, I wait for him to open a door. See, I, I don't want to fall into presumption. So I wait for him to open a door. Sometimes it takes a couple of years for him to open a door. It's soon for him, but it's a long time for me. And so finally he did begin to open a door. And we try to take advantage of every door he opens. Sometimes at the closet door, you know, there's nowhere to go but out again. <laughs> but sometimes God needs time before he can really tell me what to do. We're not ready. You need to realize that when you're praying for poor sinners or your family, your kids, they may not be ready to listen to God. You've got to keep praying. But he's working on it. He's working. You've got to pray. You've got to wait like God waits. And so we, we just begin when God opens a door. And we got one brother after another. We had our problems, you know. And now we have wonderful, wonderful brothers and holy priests and holy brothers. Without them, this network couldn't be. <laughs> because how would you take care of all these wonderful pilgrims see, when they come, huh? How do they hear? Sometimes those priests hear confessions all day. People are lined up, you know. None of that would be. And sometimes, you know, it look it seems like God is putting the cart before the horse. No. It got caught in horse all in his mind, see? Because you're not ready for the horse. He put the cart first. And that's what happened. The brothers have a great mission to teach, to say mass, to hear confessions, to give all kinds of retreats and healing services and benediction and listen to the heartaches of the people. And they need to do a lot in the media. Now they're beginning this year. After 10 years, you know, they're beginning to be floor directors and on cameras. And so that they are always outreaching you. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Hey, where are you from? This is Rita from Bellevue, Ohio. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Right? I think you're wonderful. <laughs> uh, I know you were so Jesus. honored to meet our Holy Father. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wondered, have you ever met um, Mother Teresa? Mm. I spent, uh, we were on, there were one, two, three, four of us, I think. At least three of us going to Italy. We had uh, founded a little monastery there, and we also founded a uh, recording studio that had six recording studios where we made 20,000 tapes in 20 languages, or 10,000 tapes in 20 languages. 
And we were on our way to Rome, and the uh, stewardess, or the woman at the gate, I guess it was, she came to me and she said, we're going to put you in, all of you in first class, because Mother Teresa is there. And I think the only person in first class was the president of the World Bank. And I noticed she stayed as far away from Mother Teresa and I as possible. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, she and I and the sisters spent eight hours together. And it was a, a memorable time. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Yes. Where are you from? Pennsylvania. Wonderful. What is your question? Well, I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, one is, how did you become interested in becoming a nun? And did you know that was your calling? And how can I, like, do something to become a nun? Like, <laughs> I don't know how to explain it, but I'm only 14 years old, and I really want to be a nun when I'm older. You want to be one? Yes. Good for you. I hated it when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> I never wanted to be a nun. I really never did. Um, but I, I didn't choose to be a nun. God chose me. When I was healed, I think I told you that before, of a stomach ailment, I knew for the first time when I was in my late teens, 18, perhaps 19, and I was here, and I was a, a, a nominal Catholic. We went to church Easter Christmas. I, I knew God, I believed everything, that I could recite the question and the answer, but I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know he knew me, he loved me, he cared for me, me, me. But when I got healed, I knew there was something different. He did know me just like he knew Zacchaeus. He loved me like he loved Zacchaeus. And he invited me, he called me to serve him. And the only way I knew is I used to started making stations of the cross after I was healed after work. And I had made my stations and I knelt before the the Pieta, the sorrowful mother. And I when I knelt down I knew. At that moment I knew I had a vocation. I didn't know where. And I tried very hard to answer a few uh, different uh, uh, orders, but I, I, they, wouldn't, they didn't want me because my grades were so bad. That's why people think I'm so smart. <laughs> <laughs> I worked hard for my Fs. <laughs> well, I was down the scale. And I'm not excusing myself, but when you're hungry and cold, very poor, and you're one one uh, one parent family. You're not interested in the capital of Iowa. You're interested only in survival. I didn't know God. See, I'm afraid I'm not a good example of how to get a vocation. But I think if you want to, to be a nun, that's already a beginning a beginning, and you have to ask Our Lady every day, say, Sweet Mother, if, if I'm called to serve your son, please show me the way. And she will go to Mass, say your rosary every day. Most important, I would think also, not most important, is to begin to read the lives of the saints. Good books, good spiritual books. Prepare your heart. Put it in the right direction. If you have a vocation, you'll know it one day like I did. We have another call. Hello? Mother Angelica? Yes. Yeah, my name is Guy Ashley. I'm from West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh-huh. 
And I'm going through a difficulty right now, and my marriage of 16 years is ending up in a divorce. And out of that marriage, three wonderful children were born. Mm -hmm. And I was baptized in the Roman Catholic Church. Even though I do believe in the existence of the mighty Lord, and I know He's real, mm -hmm. I want to know why, if it's wrong, that it, it seems to me it's only when I'm in trouble that I seek His help. Mm -hmm. I want to know if it is wrong to do so, and if He's still going to listen to my prayer. Oh, I, you know what the Lord said one day? He said, when a sinner repents, all of heaven rejoices. You make him very happy up there, see? Because you're coming back to Jesus. Unfortunately, it may have taken a, a divorce to get you back. Huh? You always have an opportunity to go back, come back to Jesus. Always. You should never, never, never uh, despair. I didn't know Jesus until I got sick and it was healed. Everybody, sometimes those of us that are stubborn, whatever, we, we have a tendency not to need God until a need is there. That's unfortunate. But God loves you very special. And maybe with this trial you're suffering, you'll begin to pray. You'll go back to Jesus. You'll go back to Our Lady. Ask Him to mend this marriage. Ask Him to mend this deep, deep hurt. And go to confession. Show Jesus that you really want to change. Hmm? You really want to change. You really want Jesus to change your heart, to change your wife's heart. And, and you don't want to just go there now because you got a, an intention. You want to use this opportunity well, we ran out of cop dog. Uh, anybody got one? You want to use this opportunity to come back to Jesus. See? Oh, he hears your prayer. He will always, always hear your prayer. The worst sinner in the world. When Teresa say Teresa, the little flower, wanted to save souls. And she heard this man was going to be hung or beheaded, I forget what it was, because he killed um, a man and a woman. And he was very, very angry. He didn't want a priest around. And she prayed and prayed and prayed. And then she read, as he's gone up the guillotine, or the hangman's noose, whatever, he kissed a crucifix. He was sorry. Thank you. He was sorry. See how quick. So please, let this terrible pain that you suffer in your heart, and your wife too, don't forget, she's suffering too, be an occasion for you to come back to Jesus. Well, we only have three minutes left. If there's a Zacchaeus out there, <laughs> who has the bundle he wants to lift from his sinful soul. <laughs> I'm here. If you have half, nobody owes me anything, so you can't give me four times back. But we need you. You, he needs you, and I need you. I just got a little note there. It says, a caller was upset because you called him a Jew. He wasn't a bad man, but he was a son of Abraham. Jesus called him that. He was a son of Abraham. The Lord said that. 
He wasn't a bad man, but he did steal. But the Lord loved him a lot. That's not being anti-Semitic. My best friends are Jews, Italians, Portuguese, Spanish, and every other nationality. So not that like oversensitive about the scriptures. The man was a tax collector, but he was had a heart, the heart of someone who was readily repentant. Now I can't afford not to remind you that this network depends entirely upon you. If one of you, every one of you listening gave 25 cents in one month, I wouldn't ask you again for anything for five years. <laughs> <sighs> wouldn't that be wonderful? 56 million homes in this country watch this network. Even a quarter apiece would be too much. I wouldn't want it. Please. <laughs> you need somebody like me to make you miserable. <laughs> you need somebody like this network to teach you, to make you repentant, to tell you how much God loves you and how much you need him. And so, be generous, will you? Put us between your gas and electric bill. Cost a big, big bundle to keep this coming into your home. Well, we're going to be back with Jeff Caven tomorrow night. We'll have a lot of fun and teach you a lot. Jesus loves you. Don't forget it.